So this is John's re warm up before we really put it to work. Um, I'm especially delighted to introduce John as we've known each other for many years. Uh, indeed, uh, we first met when we first started out as academics back in the day. Uh, he hails from these islands, but has been long in Australia, there and back a couple of times. And uh, although our paths have really not crossed much in recent years, uh, John Hartley is a hard man to ignore, uh, given his significant body of published work, his long-standing editorial activities in the formation of cultural studies, and his influence as an exemplar for younger generations of scholars. John is research professor in media and communications at the University of Sydney, and his lecture is titled Present at Their Own Making, <laughs> and it aims to answer uh, an intriguing question, which is in the era of global digital media, how do we make a pandemic class? I think that would be the way to pronounce it, John, on pandemic. Um, anyway, there's a nice, easy conundrum for everyone to solve, and for those who are doing research, please pray it doesn't end up as one of your assignments. <laughs> uh, let's move on to John's intellectual firework display. He's asked me to comment on his work, and I'll do so but when he concludes, because I don't want to disappoint him by doing nothing. <laughs> Uh, so please give John Hartley one of those famous welcomes for which Glasgow is world renowned. <laughs> uh, it's John, I'll turn something on. Don't need a mic. No, no, yes, this is my right. It's gone green. Does that work? Um, I just want you to know that it's one o'clock in the morning. Um, but it did feel like that when we were brought up. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, try this. Is this all right? Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. I begin today. Next slide. Do I do it? I do it. Oh, how about that? Yeah. Okay, I begin today by acknowledging the Luna and Jabigal people, the traditional custodians of the land in which this work was created, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. When Philip Schlesinger has delivered his considered verdict on creative policy discourses, uh, which he did in 2017, he said, if we stop talking about okay, uh, if we stop talking about the creative economy, would anything be lost? Hardly is. Craft sensibilities, the achievement of high-level skills, uh, or the fastidious making of objects. Have not disappeared. All that talk about creative industries is simply a compelling label of convenience that has moved the economy in the driving seat to shape public discourse so insistently, says. Well, craft sensibilities have been used for other purposes than making artifacts. As Julian Huxley pointed out, uh, there are also many facts and social facts. These include group formation, community consciousness, and cultural institutions, including trade unions, the labor movement, and societies for workers, health and educational welfare. 
people name discourses of collective organization, self realization, theory and critique, and agit prop. And thence, such intangibles as human rights, social justice, and political equity. A compelling label of convenience, then, is also available for this uh, type of creativity, the label of class. Specifically, working people and their allies made what Marx called a class for itself, both the class against capitalism and class consciousness for collective action. That's where cultural studies came in, at least in the UK. But after it crossed the Atlantic, class withered as a conceptual crux. Uh, much less creative industries has done uh, more recently. Perhaps, perhaps these two unloved concepts mean each other. What can we make that does not put the economy in the driving seat? In order to explain what I'm getting at, here are three types of discursive and mediated making, each one dedicated to what we might call future making. One, class making, is the construction of collective identity, where identity, ideas, and agency are ascribed to a group rather than an individual creative artist or entrepreneur. World making is a term borrowed from the film industry, applied to the creative processes of imagining worlds in both fact and fiction across any medium or platform. And policy making is a very special kind of fiction dedicated to imagining into existence the economies it describes. But can it work for everyone? First, class making. Global systems long dominated by politics or coercion, by the economy or consumerism, and by technology or automation are first created in culture, in the semiosphere, and distributed in story and drama or the media, and powered by something that better analysts than me have been bold enough to call love. This unlikely setting opens an alternative policy pathway, superseding the failing paradigms of competitive individualism and adversarial conflict, and drawing on poetic or romantic, with a capital R, uh, as well as scientific or realist apprehensions of modernity. E.P. Thompson, his book, Making of the English Working Class, celebrates its 60th anniversary this year. One of its most memorable lines occurs right at the start. Thompson, Thompson justifies his title by defending the words making and class. Present at its own making means, one, means that one of the things it made was itself, the identity and agency of those who marched under its banner. And Thompson saw class as a verb, not a category, something which in fact happens, he says, and can be shown to have happened to human relationships. Thompson writes exclusively about the English working class, but he imagines that their story is, is universal because it provoked or provoked, it, it proved to have world system effects. The greater part of the world today, he says, is analogous to our own experience during the Industrial Revolution. In terms of historical method, imagining an entire class as male and English means that history isn't quite as real as Thompson supposes. The story of a self-making class where only Englishmen get a speaking role is what a historian Yuval Harari would call a fiction. Ferrari, of course, is making a general claim. He categorizes as fiction those inventions of human culture that don't grow on trees. Gods, nations, money, Peugeot, the law, and classes are unknown in the natural world. These fictional entities all belong in the human semiosphere. 
None of these things exists uh, outside the stories that people invent and tell one another, says Harari. There are no gods, no nations, no money, and no human rights, except in our collective imagination. Making the semiosphere, which characterizes humanity as a whole and myriad subgroups within it, enables collective identity and action to be powered by stories. The force, uh, force of production that political economy discounts as illusory. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. It does no disrespect to, Thompson, uh, to Thompson's achievement to call it a triumph of fiction. Once uttered, his writing belongs to the semiosphere. Thompson opens class making to the world of lang language games, Wittgenstein and Leotard, textualization, Baudrillard, discourse, Foucault, mediation, Echo and Bart, or structured opposition, Ultra Sag. Similarly, his insistence on embodiment collides with one of the long term uh, concerns of feminism. Thompson himself defines class not categorically, but in terms of relations of opposition uh, to other classes and love for one's own. We cannot have love, he says, without lovers. In its very commitment to realism, the making of the English working class is, in my view, an epic poem of the industrial age, comparable to foundation myths familiar in other contexts, from Paradise Lost to The Handmaid's Tale. It can withstand a reading which, uh, which is informed by Bart, Echo, Hugo, and the rest, because of the work that such myths do is real. Indeed, myth-making is fundamental to world-making throughout human history and across the fact fantasy divide. The analytical approach that makes this discovery possible is postmodern cultural theory. Uh, the constellation of relativist thought that Thompson himself dismissed as Geschichten Scheißen Schlaf. Unhistorical shit. Thompson's in that, it's not a proper word. <laughs> The Germans do have a word for everything, but that's not one of them. Uh, anyway, Thompson's imagined biography of class agency is nevertheless an epitome of cultural theory. Class is a story made by its own characters. Every story needs its bards whose songs play a creative role in constituting what they describe. Like Paradise Lost, the making is the literary imagination of a single author, World making at an epic scale, making past and present, rulers and ruling, local and global. It's an ancestral myth of the ancestry of, uh, uh, sorry, of the origin of the people. It's a narrative story to populate the past with personifications of the present. It's a tale of a self made hero. It's the poetics of verisimilitude and realism, legitimating semiotic. Truth effects. Like Milton, Thompson uses what he calls images as evidence of a powerful subjective motivation. He draws attention to what he calls the psychic energy stored and released in language, which offers, he says, a sign of how men felt and hoped, loved and hated, and how they preserved certain values in the very texture of their language. Well, as a component of working class consciousness, this kind of love is not understood as primarily sexual, love of a person, or, uh, but universal, love of creation, and with that, of an imagined creator. Thompson can't avoid acknowledging the contributions made to working class subjectivity by religious writers like Bunyan and the Wesleyans, the Methodists, but he can't resist conflating religious and sexual desire by dubbing some of the Methodist imagery as psychic masturbation. He sees religion as self-love, psychotic affliction. Thompson doesn't want love to be personal or spiritual. He wants it to be a political agent, understood and revolutionary. Class love 
is solidarity under the flag of life, signifier of mutual commitment to collective action unto death, you might say. Thus, in Manchester in 1819, Thompson writes, it was not the flags so much as the discipline of the 60 to 100,000 who assembled in St. Peter's Field, which aroused such alarm. <laughs> The union of love and death was one of the major tropes of ascendant romanticism. In Manchester that day, love was expressed in peaceable but purposeful assembly, the very sight of which provoked authoritarian crackdown. This love was high treason to be met with sabers, multiple deaths, prosecutions, and imprisonment. And in an early instance of propaganda, those consequences were applied exclusively to the peaceful protesters. None of the perpetrators was prosecuted. However, journalists were present, including the radical publisher Richard Carlyle and John Tyas of the Times. Their reports turned a provincial atrocity into an international scandal in which the massacre, not the protest, took center stage. Far from being suppressed, the reform movement gained psychic energy. Peter Lou achieved its own mythic status, not simply because it happened, but also because it was so widely reported. Peter Lou was a media event from the start. The Economist has gone so far as to, do, to ascribe the two-party tradition of British politics ever since to a Waterloo versus Peterloo divide. It remains a touchstone in adversarial politics to this day, not, because of it, not least because of its starring role in the making. Thus, class making is a discursive, creative practice. Some of its most compelling fictions circulate under cover of history science, politics, and economics. All of these realisms are artifacts of the semiosphere communicated in media. Culture makes groups, groups make knowledge, and the clash of, the, the clash of classes makes history. So, two world making. World building or world making has come to prominence through the film industry in a familiar, as a familiar technique in speculative fantasy and science fiction. It is a technique for putting characters and action into dialogue and uh, with the physical world in which they move, such that the viewer learns as much about their identity, motivation, ethics, and relationships in the scene as they do from the story. The world gets a speaking role, as it were. World building does not rely on very similitude or recognizable resemblance to a known external world, but on plausibility and logic, the truth of them, of highly artificial codes, connections, and structured hierarchies. Using these, producers can rely on an assumed intertextual knowledge, while viewers can recognize what's going on, reading through the text to a shared perception, otherwise known as reality. It was during a turbulent era of technological disruption as the world turned from creative industries uh, to digital technologies, from art to smart, that world building began to trend among creative professionals. One of the most influential pioneers was Alex McDowell. He migrated from London, uh, the London punk scene, to Hollywood and took up production design. He distilled his approach, his approach to world building into an explicit teachable system. There it is. McDowell's evolving mandala for world building is a visualization of the semiosphere in microcosm. This model of cinematic and digital world making is a technique that can be observed live in the real world of digital culture. It takes for granted what we perceive in order to live our shared unwelt is both artifice and shared semiosis. Reality is made up, crafted, collective, and interdisciplinary fiction in which human-centered stories can invoke an entire cosmos. 
It's a model of the semiosphere, you know, mm -hmm. whose limits and possibilities humans gain their identity, their meaning, and their motivation for action. World making is interdisciplinary, drawing from multiple knowledge systems and collective or made by many. It relies on collaborative creativity, which in turn relies on the organization of a complex, diverse, and autonomous network of creative professionals whose specialist talents must cohere in overall vision for a need to work. For the people that it's talking about earlier. For audiences, drama and narrative must occupy a readable semiotic space. The fantasy universe must have a human story at the center, says Dow. Macro world and micro characters create each other in simultaneous mutual translation. Human scale subjectivity is carried by actors and plot, while the entire world in which the drama unfolds is present of its own making in the location, sets, design, props, technologies, costumes, music, color palette, sound effects, camera work, CGI, tempo, and directorial style. Here, audience literacy is both productive and limiting. McDowell makes the future legible by projecting recognized brand names, urban architecture, and street furniture into currently unknown forms, while at the same time, the characters still speak American, and individual identity is still marked by, we say, unacknowledged race and gender. Biologically, the human story at the center must be one of us, and a familiar in the here and now, in order to open unknown horizons of possibility for our contemplation. The precepts of this interdisciplinary collective and computational model can be applied to natural groups or beings out there in the wild, the cultural wild. The same self-creative and self-reflexive semiotic systems, rules and processes that make individual characters also make groups including classes, a class is organized around the means of its own mediation. As the means of mediation have expanded to include uh, to uh, digital and global ubiquity, so the formation of a world class is made possible. Jason Potts and I have used the term Dean to describe any culture-created, self-knowing human group, big or small. Deans are familiar in both political history, the root of demo demography and democracy, and in the biosciences, where a dean is an interbreeding subpopulation of any species. Thence, in culture, deans are specialized subpopulations by place or countries, by function or institutions, and by ideology or religions. Held together in a semiosphere of their own collective making. But there's something peculiar about a class that aspires to global extension and human agency. As, a, as we've seen, a class is constituted in opposition to others, so there can be no unitary, planetary class. If there were, it would not be a class, because it would not be opposed to another class. So how can there be a worldwide and pan-human class, and how can it take collective action as a class. Is there a class consciousness across the digital semiosphere? To consider this, I'll illustrate the general argument in this text with an important example from those slides. That's a little kind of slide out. Synchronicity now. Existing classes are defined by economic activity, uh, the working class by social status, middle class, or by power, the ruling class. The class I want to identify is defined by its mediated ubiquity across institutions, countries, and religions. In the digital space, that's more inclusive than Mackenzie Walks's hackers class, but less with less proprietorial vested interest than her vectoral class, but not the same. It operates in the wide open plains of popular culture to connect and cohere multiple existing and emerging groups 
into a pan of human reliance, made not of owners, but of users. What should it be called? It's a political class because it is opposed to and by adversarial groups. It's a mediated class because its identity and agency can go viral across any and all um, um, demographic boundaries. Its speed and scale of reproduction across the global atmosphere is infectious. It can have only one name, albeit with very different connotations since the year 2020. It is the pandemic class. It may be global, but it's not the only player on the field. Rebels in favor of a system changing revolution characterize the far right as well as climate activists. Both such groups are as much online phenomena as they are physical. They tend to emerge as amorphous, centerless, leaderless networks defined by shared ideology, organization, and activism, not by workplace, party, or country. Roger Griffin was the first to connect what he called group hustle. Group hustle or group hustle is, I don't know how you say it. Of course. Group hustle. Right, one of those. Um, group hustle is like a course. Don't mind it here. Uh, of far right extremists with the capillary, what he calls the capillary penetration into the nervous system of planetary society of the world wide web. No matter how minuscule such group muscles calls circulate unimpeded throughout the virtual community, infecting individuals via such apparently apolitical organs as online games, sports, and chat rooms. At the same time, these group muscles could be infiltrated in turn by state agencies, Russia, as mentioned, seeking to destabilize their own opponents with geostrategic advantage. Griffin concludes that the group muscular right could be seen as, and I'm quoting, the intangible diaphanous shape of extremist things to come in the age of high modernity. Quote, we are now witnessing how prescient he was and how slow incumbent representative systems have been to respond. Nevertheless, even as the authoritarian right and terroristic accelerationists were gaining ground in the world of politics and media, an opposing pandemic class was in process of self formation, bottom up, emerging not from post fascist ideology, but from popular pentium, bonded not by conspiratorial paranoia, but by common media literacy. This class has often been identified with its generational emergence. Here are the millennial and Gen Z, Gen Z um, cohorts, youth activists, and non binary girls of all ages. They did not emerge from Richard Sennett's classic locus of politics, the links, uh, but from the marketplace of identity, the agora, where mixture, difference, and diversity are the media of exchange. Their modus operandi is open as opposed to conspiratorial. Far from being accelerationists, these acti activists want to stop the viral growth of global destructiveness. In short, the pandemic class is based not in hate and conflict, but on love and connection. Not a group of school, but a deep. Not on Q and on or four chan, but on TikTok. The core players tend to avoid commercial intermediaries or celebrity influencers. Instead of taking you to their leader, their actions perform class identity for themselves, both live and online. Climate justice action works directly to influence government and corporate policy, but such staged conflict also dramatizes pandemic class solidarity. The pandemic class is leaderless and decentralized, although it does throw up celebrity activists and influencers. Um, see my favorites up there. Although it does throw up, I'm sorry, I've done that. Um, it, at its core are rule generating codes for self recognition and self organization, but at the same time, it engages in dialogue with other demons and other classes, meetings within 
political leaders, for example, connecting with allies in what they call this crew of Earth defenders and calling out the adversaries. This would uh, mean that this periphery is a dynamic zone of uncertainty and innovation. It is an axiom of systems bioscience that an organism must be able to describe itself in order to distinguish itself from the environment. And it's an axiom of semiotics that a semiosphere operates through what Yuri Lotman calls auto communication self description. Cultural texts that are about and addressed to uh, the culture itself. Self description then is vital for both the constitution and the administration of complex systems, and is a defining feature, also the bio semioticians tell us, of life. Class is no exception. In the case of a pandemic class for climate justice, self-representation takes the form of personalizing and dramatizing the purposes, processes, achievements, and setbacks of class activism. Founded in difference and opposition, such movements take on characteristics that they themselves have created and proliferated across multiple platforms, accruing a depth of mediation, story, and imagery to enable mutual self-recognition among very dispersed populations. Present at their own making and self-organized for collective action, the pandemic class shows just how far selfies can reach into the impersonal processes of cultural transformation. So, for example, in October 2022, Greta Thunberg launched the Climate Book, a 100 handed effort to connect the dots, as she says, between different faces of the crisis we face to create what she calls a holistic picture of how the world is changing and what we need to do about it. So, the third, we come at last, policy. Jacobin's Tom Mills observes that the ruling class, too, is present of its own making. Its voice may be ventriloquized through favored groupuscles uh, with names, opaque names, like Deloitte's, E and Y, APMG, or PWC. I got some of them. Such discourse might well be characterized as the ruling class thinking aloud which may be why it's uncritical amplification in the news and some bits of academia uh, uh, is a component of the general collapse in trust for public administration. So instead of that kind of policy discourse, I turn directly to the creative role of scholarship and of disciplinary knowledge systems. Possibilities and experiments abound there of making pandemic choices or futures Justin Hohmann Pilat, German evolutionary economist, sinologist, argues that some of the most empirical and realist sciences are not descriptive but formative. In particular, economics performs what it describes. It reduces reality to a textual model and then analyzes that with a view to installing the model itself as an economic reality external to the discipline that is brought into the field. Economics, humanities, and the social sciences all perform what they analyze. The semiotic means by which cultural economic actions are known are endogenous to the system they describe. In complexity jargon, knowledge systems are auto-poetic, self-made, reflexive, self-knowing, and adaptive. They change. Their self-description continuously performs how they know. Wilhelm Dilby calls them Geisterswissenschaften, not an historical ship, but performative sciences. And that is a real word. In this respect, scholarly knowledge can be recast as a specialist semiosphere, directing and coordinating collective action. Thinking is a maker, analysis is creative. Knowledge is a causal force of innovation, playing a creative role in imagining the economies and cultures being described into you know, existence. 
Scholarship is therefore part of the creative economy. It produces future facing novel ideas. Some are taken up as innovations in economic practice, causing unpredictable <coughs> changes downstream. Others are dismissed as mere fictions. So here is a class struggle in language from which the efforts of individual scholars and uh, as well as entire disciplines are not exempt. Even the cosmologists are getting into the reflexology problem. I'm sorry, the reflex. <laughs> The reflexivity problem. <laughs> I watched too much television, obviously. Um, when the natural sciences start talking about the university, I'm sorry, I've gone to I've gone to a lot more than that. Um, when the natural sciences start talking about the universes, uncanny fitness for life, and the biology of love, it seems that a paradigm shift is complete from a competitive, selfish gene view of science towards one based on cooperative relations, mutuality, and context. But how to translate that shift into the media sphere, or what well, Christian Bancroft has recently called the platosphere sphere? Well, uh, industry consultant Charlie Ledbetter once a go-to advisor in the new economy has caught the love bug. He's been working with a group called Taxi, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, uh, on a project called Love Meets Power. He says that the big choice for the future is, I'm quoting, between those who want, us, uh, want to return us to a world powered by competition, profit and anger, and those who want it to be powered by love. He paints a picture of diminishing public civility and trumped up tribalism. When that was really interrupted by the global pandemic, uh, the COVID one, the sudden importance of health professionals caused what Ledbetter called, uh, caused what Ledbetter calls a collective expression of love combined with power. Love is a creative, generative force. Well, as everyone knows, the power meets love theme let loose by the pandemic was quickly appropriated for the partisan political game. When Boris Johnson emerged from hospital and number 10, after a period of intensive care with COVID, he declared that the National Health Service is love. That was not sufficient to fend off what some see as a terminal crisis for the NHS. You can't actually replace you know, cuts with care. Love is not enough. Ledbetter's recipe requires tolerant love, focused professional efficiency prepared to learn. Ed Oakley, among others, has teased out the policy implications for care and mutual aid in what she calls the pandemic politics of cultural work. Which John calls it love. The power of love vision division is not confined to the welfare and health sector. Alternative policy uh, possibilities apply, both locally and globally. In Ledbetter's words, we need an ethic of commitment to a person, to relationship, community, company, or team, so that they can achieve their full potential. This is a constitutional rather than an administrative perspective, ensuring mediation in terms of Enzensberger's social and socialized purpose <coughs> of the many, not the property of the few. And so we come at last to future making. Paul Gilroy has recommended that the way to build on the contributions of cultural studies is to find the courage necessary, I'm quoting, to argue that identity formation, even body coded <coughs> ethnic, ethnic and gender identity, is a chaotic process that can have no end. Likewise, he says, there is no one, well, he didn't say there's no one class the real one, but I say that, but he says, uh, there's only radical possibilities in which we can begin to imagine ways of reconciling the particular and the general. This brings responsibilities for everyone. The policy question, what's next, 
was not confined to one cause, one solution, or one consultant, but applies across across what we're now learning to call everything, everywhere, all at once. A first priority is to build and connect collaborative groups across the boundaries of unit diversity and knowledge difference. Making a pandemic class for intersectional activism clearly requires a new understanding of how work class works in the era of the Anthropocene. Collective agency, what we used to call class struggle, uh, needs to be pandemic, open, activist led, and media performed. Intersectional action is vital to achieve constitutional system change. The emergent class struggle to change minds and actions is decentralized, social, and digital, conducted across platforms as well as across platforms. As far as knowledge goes, collective action is informed by connective thinking. What's needed is coordination across multiple boundaries. Oppositional leaderships have emerged among numerous popular fronts, as they used to be called, linking activism directly to science and journalism, universities and media. Truth is not just analytical or privatized by experts, but almost but also performative, popularized by teenagers. An open pandemic class means everyone is a maker. Greta Thunberg says, you must take it from here and carry on connecting the dots yourself, because right there, between the lines, you will find the answers, the solutions that need to be shared with the rest of humanity. So here's some policy advice from one wise teenager. She says, everyone is needed, everyone is welcome, no matter where you live, no matter where you come from, no matter your age or your background. It may work if everyone uh, this is that unquote. It may work if everything, if everyone does at least one thing rather than nothing. Uh, Thunberg says hope is taking action. And Louisa Mullenbauer from Germany reminds us that hope is the work. Radical confidence is an act of resistance. And I say creativity is no longer a spectator sport. Thank you very much. The slides come to the on the left side. Um, I said they're rather busy, John. And he said everyone is an artwork. Um, I'm sure you agree. Um, and uh, my uh, commiserations for having to do a kind of uh, after midnight performance. It is not easy, I know. So, uh, John was rather insistent that I respond to this, so I, I will do my best because it's a very wide ranging talk and I, I can only sort of uh, <coughs> consider a few angles. Um, it strikes me that perhaps from Thompson to Tuba might be the type of paper where we publish it eventually. And uh, thank you, John, for my name check at the start of your lecture that's a tremendous relief because i now have my one citation of the year <laughs> the principal will be delighted um Kate Oakley, well she, she sorted too um so let me just offer a view um on your on your talk which is complicated and uh, demanding um i thought perhaps the best way to get into it is to pick up on the choice of e.p thompson's work as the launch pad for the analysis, you know, recognizing actually that it will not be familiar to many people here. Um, and um, I, I think it's really quite inspiring to see this venerable work revisited in the global digital context. Um, Thompson, just to remind people, was 
a towering influence on the intellectual left, uh, an early critic of the marketization of higher education, which he left, a talented and tough-minded polemicist as well as a historian, an ironist about politics during an earlier period of economic decline. There's a marvelous essay called Sir writing by candlelight when people were confined without electricity to their homes uh, during the three-day week, uh, which we had. It's another great British um, achievement. Um, and he was an, an ex-soldier uh, tempered by war. And uh, I do think uh, one of the things we should take away from John's talk is that in our field, you really do need to have a sense of history uh, of how the problems that we address have developed, where they come from, and uh, Professor Hartley has provided this, and I think this ensures that an important echo from the past still has a contemporary purpose. Now, Thompson's book, which is not light, um, you know, a substantial uh, 900 pages, something like that, it's fine-grained and brilliantly <laughs> written, and it's a history from below about the making of a national working class. And I will inflect this a little differently from you, John. It's an English one rather than a British one. And in today's uh, global context of intensified nationalism, of accelerating geopolitical and geoeconomic competition, it's vital to recognize the huge importance of nationhood and its relations to culture. But it's the boundaries created by states and nations that have to be transcended, John Hartley argues, I think. And without that, how could a world-making class solve our planet's problems? He further suggests that the affordances of digital communications are a cornerstone of a novel, still emergent set of relations with the potential to establish broader new solidarities between us. So Professor Hartley espouses a politics of hope, and to be sure we do need this. The stories we tell ourselves are important ways of expressing and delineating what Raymond Williams called our structures of feeling. But beneath the teeming and noisy pictures of religious, intellectual, and laboring lives that Edward Thompson evoked, there remains a non-reductionist Marxist view of class struggle as based in irreconcilable interests and antagonisms. And in his wide-ranging evocation of a possible future, John Hartley both recognizes this tough reality and clearly wishes it were not so. Uh, he cites the phrase, we can't have love without lovers. Thompson's sentence continues, nor can we have deference without squires and laborers. And this points to the irreducible roles prescribed by a structure of social relations. Thompson's history continually evokes the brutality of the labor process and of political repression, sadly in terms that many millions would still recognize today. Love is contextually described when Thompson recounts how working parents try to stop their children suffering from the worst excesses of the factory system's exploitation of labor. Thompson's work is a critique of gross inequality and political oppression, which John certainly evokes in his lecture. It is an account of a quest for democracy within a national political order. Organized religion is depicted as a tributary of the wider organization of class struggle. Self-organization by working people is a key stepping stone towards the possession of knowledge to be used in fighting for one's interests, for material well-being and civil and political rights. And of course, that struggle continues today. The link made to digital world-making, if we start with Thompson, we have to consider how such material practices and transformations interpenetrate with ideas and technologies in the making of culture. John Hartley provides us with an account of systems of production that seek to shape how we see the world. 
while we carefully constructed digeses of movies and games and VR are open to our diverse readings, readings and interpretations. The struggle for control over ways of seeing and acting are still at the heart of media analysis. Of course, digital ubiquity may well offer roots into the reconstruction of communicative space. Although we rightly acknowledge this, we also need to temper our redemptive vision by recognizing the impediments we face. One of them is the present intensifying global turn to exclusionary versions of national sovereignty and the control and censorship of the digital spaces we inhabit. This fight over the mediated public sphere differs in extent according to the diverse political regimes and constitutions that prevail in different places. In short, it remains the case that states and their monopolies of violence, both physical and symbolic, matter greatly. In ways that still reflect the classic problems of our field, we're presently in a battleground for democratic expression whose form and constraints have recomposed along with changes in technology and political, social, and economic organization. The spearing hand of history is still evident in present struggles over freedom of expression. These are never closed, nor ever definitively resolved. And present realities do indeed connect to E.P. Thompson's discussion of intense and bitter struggles over control of the printed press in the early 19th century. Now, by now, it will be clear that John and I each have our own favorite ways of reflecting on these questions. Uh, when I listen to him talk about a pandemic class, I'll keep the hyphen, John, you got rid of it. And in times of COVID, you're not quite sure whether to smile or shudder at the multiple meanings of this term. I do think that this is another way of talking about enlightened cosmopolitanism and its potential. The drive to transcend national and state boundaries for a common global good is what animates such vision. Mm -hmm. There's also a connection between John's arguments and some theories of the intellectual. For instance, the sociologist Karl Mannheim's idea that deep differences and sharply antagonistic perspectives can somehow be transcended and refashioned to a new synthesis. Now, this view was articulated a good century ago at a time of profound social and political conflict when liberal democracies struggled to contain both Nazism and Soviet communism, often with a fateful lack of success. The rise of the pandemic class evoked by John Hartley also needs to be analyzed in the context of the, the history of new class theories. These have flourished particularly since we first started talking about post-industrialism in the middle of the 20th century. New classes are generally seen as the bearers of solutions to our problems. And herein lies the attractiveness of the search for the emergent. New class theories are successors of classical Marxism, where the seizure of power by the proletariat was envisaged as resolving the contradictions of capitalism and establishing the foundations for a communist society. Such theories always point towards the creation of a new order. In our own field, the most recent and perhaps influential evocation of new class theory came a couple of decades ago. Richard Florida provided an echo chamber for this perspective. The designation and promotion of a new creative class has permeated contemporary thinking about the creative economy. And the way John Hartley depicts the new pandemic class, its media and tech savvy, its activism, and its capacity to make alliances across boundaries, has much in common with Florida's ideal of sophisticated and tolerant urbanity as the basis for creative clustering, except, of course, the cluster is global rather than local. In ways that I greatly welcome, 
uh, this evening's lecture has invited us to rethink seriously about who we are and how we resolve our collective problems. The climate crisis affects us all profoundly. And only last week, the International Panel on Climate Change once again told us how close we are to the very edge of uncontainable dangers. As the faithfully interconnected inhabitants of this planet, these are warnings we must heed. And then when wars such as that in Ukraine might seem at first blush to be local, but they're global in impact as we've seen over the past year. They affect alliance systems, struggles over the rules of the international order, and have had major international impacts on food and energy security. The emergent networks that John Hartley evokes are not yet a class and may never be one. He points to a possibility, a politics of hope. Of course, this perspective raises many questions about the sustainability of new forms of connective action. How will they play out in the context of global antagonisms still rooted in a state system? The so-called rules-based international order is itself being contested and international institutions remain relatively weak, although sometimes they do work. The aspirations for change identified tonight have invited us to discuss how best to devise strategies and to recognize that there are both advances and retreats in any class struggle, whether these be within states or across their frontiers. Resuming my role of chair, I will now call myself to order <laughs> and ask myself to stop being a respondent. Um, it remains for me to say thanks to Professor John Hartley for putting these momentous and difficult questions on the map. He and I will doubtless debate these matters during the rest of his stay, oh dear, but we certainly won't do that now. 